welcome back to another episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter, and thank you for taking the time out of your day to be with me here and now. I'm really excited about this episode. Happy that I finally tracked down Dr. Joel Kahn. He's a busy guy. Actually, we're supposed to meet up in person a few weeks ago at his restaurant in Detroit, Um, but he was actually called away that weekend to be on the Dr. Oz show of all things. So we'll let it slide, Dr. Khan, but I'm happy to have finally connected. Since then, he had, he's also appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast where he was um, engaged in the popular vegan versus paleo debate. So in in this conversation with him, we kind of reflect on that experience for him dive into some other topics that they didn't have a chance to dive into in that long conversation, such as caloric restriction and the fasting mimicking diet, the longevity diet, all that kind of stuff. Um, so Dr. Khan, he, if, if you know, if you've read any of his books or if you've listened to his podcast or if you've been to his restaurant, these are just a few of his projects. And if you have, he he needs no introduction, but I'll just give one just in case this is your first introduction to Dr. Khan and his amazing work. So at his core, Dr. Khan believes that plant-based nutrition is the most powerful source of preventative medicine on the planet. I agree, Dr. Khan. Having Having practiced traditional cardiology since 1983, it was only after his own commitment to a plant-based vegan diet that he truly began to delve into the realm of non-traditional diagnostic tools, prevention tactics, and nutrition-based recovery protocols. These ideologies led him to change his approach and focus on being a holistic cardiologist. He passionately lectures throughout the country about the health benefits of a plant-based, anti-aging diet, inspiring a new generation of thought leaders to think scientifically and critically about the body's ability to heal itself through proper nutrition. Thank you, Dr. Khan. I believe that I am one of those new generation thought leaders, so I'm really happy to be um, magnifying this message that you have so beautifully articulated and put into the world. And one of the world's top cardiologists, Dr. Joel Kahn, has treated thousands of acute heart attacks during his career, but he'd like all of that to stop, and he believes that it can. He'd like to prevent all future heart attacks by breaking through to the public to educate and inspire a new holistic lifestyle. Now is the time to focus on educating the public to eat clean, sweat clean, and apply cutting edge science to their life. I am fully on board, Dr. Khan, and I'm really happy to stand behind your mission and your vision, and I hope that this conversation with Dr. Khan will inspire you to get behind this as well. And uh, before we dive in, just want to remind all you listeners, throughout the month of October, there's still a couple weeks or so. we are offering 25% off of services, all services at Alter Health. So to learn more, go to www.alter.health. And obviously, um, if you're a podcast listener, would love if you subscribe, rate, and review. Always appreciate that feedback that allows me to continue the evolution of this podcast, the content to meet the needs and expectations and desires of you. So let me know how we're doing here. And why don't we just sit back, relax, and dive into this one with Dr. Joel Kahn. All right, so Dr. Kahn, welcome to the podcast, and I'm glad we uh, had the opportunity to connect here. Thank you very much. I know you get through Detroit the next time you're through Detroit, we'll meet in person. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I. By the way, your your restaurant was like top notch. Well, thank you. We yeah. work hard at it, like every restaurant owner. Yeah, it was it was excellent. So, um, you know, I really am grateful for this opportunity to connect and kind of dive into some things maybe that were not brought to the surface to talk about with uh, on the Rogan podcast, despite like three and a half hours of 
back and forth. But what do you, I mean, that was a, first of all, that was a great display of knowledge and kind of composure and just persistence. And that was mainly a great display of bladder control, you know, almost <laughs> four hours there. And so bladder. The first thing all of, there's the first secret. The first thing all of us did when we stopped recording was beelined it to uh, to the uh, ear and all. Got to got to take care of business. So yeah. you know, given that you know that was a very comprehensive debate. You know, what do you feel like was lacking? You know, what pieces of information do you feel like was, you know, you taught you kind of sprinkled in caloric restriction kind of stuff and what yeah. did you want to talk about that you didn't feel like you had an opportunity to yeah well, i thought we might go to talk more about low carb low cal ketogenic you know hot topics in the specialty health world uh, hot topics for chris Cresser. Uh, but it turns out one we didn't have time and two the next day, he had Dom D'Agostino, a pretty well-known low-carb guy on the social media circuit. Um, and two days later, he had Dr. Rhonda Patrick, PhD, who a lot of people follow as a pretty scientific-pointed woman with a lot of thoughts about those topics. So I, I don't know if he had it as a plan not to go there or what, but it's when we finished, he told me who the guests were the next couple of days. I said, okay. Yeah, I felt a little bad we didn't get onto those topics. So my spin would have been different, would have been about the dangers of the low carb diet as is being practiced by many people unaware of some of the science data. Um, and, uh, you know, calorie restriction, we could have talked very long in terms of uh, the research of Dr. Walter Longo. I, I think Joe was, Joe Rogan was pretty unaware of that. I, I actually probably gave more shout outs to Dr. Longo than anybody during those three hours and 47 minutes to be specific. But some of them were subtle because it was the method of evaluating science that Dr. Longo teaches, the so-called five pillars of nutritional longevity research, which is really amazing, great framework to ask the question, is putting butter in your coffee a good idea? Well, you know, I said it over and over. You start with basic biochemistry. They didn't like that idea, but... That's because they're not studying the science. I mean, we do know a lot about human physiology nowadays. And, and in fact, I was just in New York with Dr. Colin Campbell, and he, you know, as a biochemist, PhD, the China study author, of course, he has great, you know, respect and reverence for basic pathways of disease and health. And he's, he shows a slide about the implications of diet and what happens and with a couple biochemical pathways, but then he puts a slide up of like the known biochemical pathways that occur in a cell after a meal. It literally looks like a war room with thousands of points. You know, every cell in our body, it's a very complex interaction. We don't know every step. But we have learned a lot. And when you talk about animal protein, plant protein, amino acids, well, Dr. Longo has really hit a home run in trying to emphasize we can be precise so that these biochemistry, epidemiology, randomized studies, look at what people are doing. They live over a hundred and it only makes sense. Think about copying that and which is largely plant, strong plant predominant diets. Uh, sure. Pretty clear Rogan had never heard of the blue zones and had never heard of Loma Linda an hmm. hour away. So you know, we could have gone a little deeper. Frankly, I actually got most every topic you know, covered. I want to talk about Finland. I wanted to talk about uh, Adventist health studies, blue zones, um, the the weakness of this data that questioned whether saturated fat was healthy or not for us, this dairy industry um, uh, uh, plan to influence uh, doctors and uh, authors, which has happened in the last decade. He called it a conspiracy theory. It's real. It's published. Um, yeah, the only thing I probably would have talked a little bit more is at my core, I'm still a cardiologist. We very briefly mentioned this crazy guy, Sean Baker, MD, the carnivore on the web, that he had gotten a heart calcium score and had actually <clears throat> checked out his heart in enough detail to know that at least for now, he's not killing himself too quickly. Um, but it's very funny. I took out my <clears throat> Joe Rogan coffee cup, just to show you. If I'm a piece of 
my computer I've been looking for. <clears throat> it's a good day. Uh, I could not find that anyway. But then I wish we would have talked a little bit more. If you're going to do one of these crazy alternative diets, how can you be relatively certain your heart, at least right now, is okay? Because <laughs> it would be particularly foolhardy to add butter in your coffee and follow a low carb animal diet if you didn't know, but actually were harboring a lot of silent heart disease, which is quite yeah. common. Yeah, you know, it seems like, I mean, ignorance is not bliss in my field. Ignorance can be death in my field. Yeah, there's, you're definitely on top of all of the, um, the studies, the carotid ultrasounds and all of the things right. that, um, you know, allow you to be on top of your game so you can be a little bit more risky, maybe yeah. not really. Um, yeah, I'll great. show your, uh, I don't know how many people actually view or listen to your podcast, but in case you're watching this, I mean, this is an example just have to be sitting on my desk in my office of a right and left carotid artery it takes about 15 minutes it's an ultrasound it's painless there's no risk um even the smallest amounts of soft or hard plaque will show up this happens to be somebody with not a touch of plaque at any point in the arteries at age 60. um this is like if you were going to say to me i'm going to go embark on a four-week keto plan I mean, knowing this, I don't still think doing it with animal and butter and cheese is a smart move, but at least you're starting good. Yeah. But this is, you know, none of them have ever had this. This happens to be my ultrasound three weeks ago. So I'm happy to know that my plants are working pretty well and I'm going to keep on with that. But you know, I, I've played around with vegan keto for a week now and then and I uh, have jacked my fat content up with avocados and yeah. Extra virgin olive oil just for a week to kind of see what the buzz is on Facebook because there is a pretty big buzz on Facebook about that. But at least I know where I'm starting and I'm not, you know, seemingly putting my health at any risk. Yeah, cool. Definitely want to get into vegan keto a bit. But first, we, there's this question that has been coming up inside of me. A lot of on the debate on the podcast with Joe Rogan. Uh, Chris was often saying, you know, there's not enough science to show this or that definitively. And right. from my perspective, it seems like there's plenty of science to show, like there's no shortage of information in the world when we look on PubMed for anything. We can prove a right. point one way or another. What are your thoughts? Do we need more science to show us something or do we have enough? Well, there are two aspects to that. One, if, if you're going to throw out I mean, at some points he said, all epidemiology is flawed. Well, if you're gonna throw that out, all of a sudden we don't have a lot of science. I mean, we lose, uh, you know, I think I said on the show 80%, and I think that's about right, of, the, of what we believe we know is a way to feed the human body it comes out of epidemiology. I mean, the whole Mediterranean diet observation, such. So uh, that's right. Number two, we'll never have. I mean, they act as if we're on the verge of getting um, a major study that will answer these questions. We won't. You deal, uh, this came up in the tobacco industry that there was a need to make recommendations to the public before there was definitive data based on the risk and the cumulative uh, evidence suggesting smoking was harmful. There was no randomized study and yet these people talk about, you know, we, we are in the dark about nutrition and all and I totally disagree. There is we have many, many principles we can stand firmly upon. Uh, yeah. We will not have that study uh, done that they're looking for. I mean, even there was an effort uh, over the last decade published in 2013 called the uh, PREDIMED, uh, but it was a Mediterranean study of quote unquote, low fat Mediterranean, although it was 36% fat. Nobody in the Ornish or Esselstyn camp will call that diet low fat. And then I standard Mediterranean diet with nuts or a standard Mediterranean diet jacked up with extra virgin olive oil. And anyways, they spent, I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars, prospectively 7,400 people followed for four or five years. A very difficult science. Turns out about three months ago, most of that science was retracted by the journal for being fraught with error. It's so hard to do those kind of studies. You can do a six week study or a four week study or a 54 patient study. But you know, everybody wants to see a 7,000 patient study of vegan versus paleo or whatever setup, not gonna happen. So the bottom line is, um, you know, Chris is wrong. There's abundant data in the plant-based world. There's overwhelming data. 
And when you synthesize it, you have to conclude that if you want to protect your health, you're eating a nearly or completely plant diet with proper supplementation and uh, you're highly protected from you know, these big chronic diseases. Uh, and you're right, if anything, I mean, I kind of collect what's new this week in nutrition. I mean, I'm waiting to see the, the data that says diabetes prevented by meat or you know, um, butter uh, reversing diabetes. It does not exist yet. This week, we got an amazing study about whole grains reversing insulin resistance. I mean, we didn't need it. We already had plenty of other studies, but it was an elegant, elegant study on power of whole grains, which, you know, if Cresser took the paleo diet, which usually is no dairy, no grains, he had a dairy back in. I don't know where he got permission to do that. He doesn't even call his program paleo. He calls it neovore. I call ours herbivore, but he calls it neovore. You know, uh, the only thing left is whole grains, and we have this big body of science how healthy whole grains are, except for a few people that have no celiac disease. Um, you know, he doesn't stand on much, I mean, at all. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like he was he was on wobbly ground the whole the whole debate. <clears throat> I hear you. Yeah, so back to this vegan keto thing, you know, there is in the world this buzz about carbohydrates, even though you just mentioned this great study on on the, right. the whole grain effects. So what do you think is the truth when it comes to carbohydrates? Should we all be on like an 80-10-10 kind of diet with super low fat, or do you think we should, and lots of carbs, or where, where should we be, generally speaking, when we're, our relationship with carbohydrates? Yeah, so, you know, in my mind, the language has to become so precise that, you know, talking about carbs in a study is never adequate. And the biggest nutrition study ever done, the pure study, used the word carbs. You have to define, you know, refined carbs Absolutely. versus, you yeah. know, complex whole food based carbs. They're a world apart. We know that. Yeah. But yet, there's an imprecision. Similarly now, since 2014, maybe before, we've had some very strong human data. We should always say animal fat, plant fat, animal protein, plant protein. If we're going to use the macronutrient description of our diets and when we're developing research studies or making personal decisions. So, I mean, you know, there are examples. I pointed it out and I'll say it again. You can take Okinawa Blue Zone where there was a very low percentage of calories from protein and fat source, largely plant protein and fat sources. And they had you know, exceedingly good health until KFC and McDonald's came in. And you can take places like Crete that had exceedingly good health with low chronic disease and good longevity. Crete is not officially a blue zone. A sister Greek island called Ikaros is the blue zone. But they had 40% of their calories from fat. It was largely very fresh extra virgin olive oil from the backyard. So the, the point of all that is, you know, in the proper setting with the proper environment and fitness and sleep and social support and absence of smoking, there probably is a range of diseases for the healthy person. I'm not denying in any way the very revered research of Dr. Ornish and Dr. Nassistan, but there is a place for a range. You know, we don't all have to eat the same plant diet and be successful. Um, and 80 10 10, um, you know, would be close to Okinawa, although some people do 80% complex carbs from largely fruit. That'd be, you know, the unique uh, way to do it. But that's a very healthy approach, actually, and very consistent with good longevity. But if somebody wants to have, you know, Dr. Furman probably leading the charge for. Maybe that fat content can be a little higher from avocados, nuts, and olives, not refined sources. So I think we can have a range, except for the very sick heart patients who would be smart to follow the proven path of you know, the overall content of fat in the diet low, and of course, only from whole plant foods. Yeah. So I, I generally say that it's risky to combine you know, carbohydrates with saturated fat and too much fat in general. And would you, are you kind of in that same camp? So yeah, to you know, again, certainly animal derived saturated fat and refined carbs, which is basically a donut made from lard, I mean, yeah. would be worst choices for health. And it isn't only that 
you know, it's pervasive donuts everywhere, although they're not all made from lard. Some are made from probably poor quality vegetable oils that are nearly as bad. Um, but actually in some of the seminary work a long time ago by Ansel Keys, pastries were actually right next to butter. They were below butter, but they were right next to butter as a food rather than talking macronutrients. But in terms of let's identify a food, butter was the most associated with early heart disease. Pastries were number two because of what you just said. Combine mm -hmm. animal-based saturated fat, combine you know, lots of refined white flour and sugar and you know, put it in a, a, in a fryer and you got yourself a nice crispy donut. Uh, that, that is highly correlated with developing premature heart disease. Um, similarly, uh, somebody I mentioned a minute ago, somebody I mentioned on the Rogan Show, Dr. Walter Longo, his uh, enormous 20 plus years of research, the book, The Longevity Diet, points out how dangerous, in his opinion, a very common model, which is a high animal saturated fat, high animal protein diet in combo, which is, of course, you know, a steak with a big uh, pat of butter on top, uh, as is often being practiced. Um, you know, that, it, it, that if you're going to pursue a ketogenic diet, uh, plant-based, or I don't recommend the animal-based, it's supposed to be high fat, low protein. Otherwise, you're just activating all kinds of aging pathways. So um, what do we do that's ever high plant fat, high high plant saturated fat, high plant protein. You'd have to construct something with olive oil, um, coconut oil, I don't know, coconut oil, and where we're gonna get our protein from. I don't know, boys and girls don't mix chlorella and coconut oil. <laughs> yeah. I still think it would be healthier than a steak with butter because it's plant-based sources, but uh, you know, I, we don't run into that combo very much in our diet. Mm. Uh, even among some of the junkier versions of vegan diets, a high protein, high saturated fat or unhealthy fat source that's uh, from plant-based. Pretty unusual, actually. Yeah. All right. Can we talk a little bit about fasting, caloric restriction, intermittent fasting? And uh, I mean, that's just such a huge new world, fast. And, you know, whenever people are talking about intermittent fasting, I usually, my response is, well, you know, that's what a lot of people are calling intermittent fasting is just normal, healthy yeah. eating rhythm. But where's the, where does uh, extended fasting, yeah. when does that come into a treatment plan or something like that? Yeah. So, you know, the, and again, precision of language is what I'll, yeah. add to the conversation and you know this but um you know, the w the most reliable path in an animal model to extend life of a, a yeast or, or an earthworm or a mouse or we've done it also in um some monkeys um is to actually drop the amount of calories in their diet particularly if you drop the calories and give them high quality food uh, when you are feeding the calorie restriction you know some the, the animal experiments are just Every day you're eating 30% fewer calories than a control group. Almost every test model will live longer because there is a response to reduce calories and uh, repairing and regenerating damaged parts of the body. Um, and it's usually you know, very powerful. There is a, a very interesting example. I'm blanking on what kind of primate it is for a minute. If it's a baboon, I think it is. But in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, they did a 20 year plus randomized trial of two groups of monkeys that had 30% um, calorie reduced or standard. And they did the same thing in Washington, DC at what's called National Institute of Aging. One group, and I'm blanking for a minute, which is which, found that the calorie restricted group lived much longer and healthier and with a better uh, appearance. And the other research group did not. And the difference was the quality of the food that the calorie restricted group was being fed. One group was fed, you know, um, really poor quality uh, monkey chow, almost a very high quality, high fiber monkey chow. The point of all that is, even in the control group, dietary quality matters. Uh, but the consistent finding is dropping your calories. Now, is that a strategy that we can teach easily? Uh, there is some data that whole food plant based eaters do naturally eat a few hundred less calories a day than certainly the standard American diet, just based on the likelihood that if you're eating fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes, it's going to be more um, nutrient-dense, dense, not calorie-dense food, like processed food. 
So we naturally may be eating fewer calories. That's why in the Adventist Health Study, the only group that had the healthy BMI was the vegan group, not the vegetarian group, not the omnivore group. But it's still a difficult deal to try and instruct people to eat less every day in our current culture. So then you get into some of the other terms. So one recommendation that's very popular now and back by some decent sciences, 12 to 14 hours a day. Some people are pushing their window to 16, um, not eating, maybe just liquids that would be officially called time-restricted feeding or TRF, not officially intermittent fasting. The real experts of the world would say you're not really fasting, although we call breakfast break fast. Uh, you're not really fasting. You're restricting your food for 12 or 14 hours. And they would reserve the word fasting to maybe 30 hours plus enough to deplete glycogen from your liver. Then you're in the fasting state. Then you might start producing ketones, and that's fasting. So time-restricted feeding, everybody should consider 8 p.m. to 9 a.m., maybe going without a meal and uh, experiencing the potential advantages for aging, inflammation, blood sugar, blood pressure control, weight control. And then you get into fasting, as you said, and it appears that the magic, now there's that 5-2 program, two days a week, um, dropping your calories and five days a week eating you know, fully. Um, there is some weight advantage, blood sugar advantage, what we call biomarker advantage. But the real magic that you see in these animal models that actually show signs of living longer, calorie restriction, is when you go three, four, five days in a row of either not eating, which is challenging and which is certainly not appropriate for many people who have medical conditions or are frail, underweight, and challenging to maintain your workload going five days with doing only water, um, or dropping your calories, something called a fasting mimicking diet that was developed at the University of Southern California, where you can still eat a modest amount, but get the uh, activity and benefits as if you went five days without any food at all. But that's when the magic happens, because you do actually fast, you do actually deplete the glycogen from your liver, you will start to make alternative fuels for the body called ketone bodies that along with glucose will fuel your body. And that's where you really turn on a process. Everybody should at least know the word autophagy, which is the ability of the body to clean up some of the debris and garbage intracellularly and in little parts of the cell called lysosomes, damage proteins, damage DNA, damage other organelles and, and uh, clear them out of the cell, regaining some youthfulness whether it's a brain cell, a heart cell, a muscle cell, kidney cell. So it takes that kind of three, four, five day uh, challenging calorie reduction or absence of calories to activate this process. And it's now real, it's now scientific, it's now available, it's now something anybody can do. It's something I do every two or three months as I'll do five days in a row of 800 calories a day of plant-based foods that are low in um, carbohydrate of the refined nature, low in glucose, a low in protein. Cool. It's only really uh, healthy fats like olives and complex carbs like nuts. Uh, and that's called fasting mimicking diet by Dr. Longo. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's great. That's the ticket right now. That yeah. is the hottest science, the hottest science in you know, longevity and reversal of diseases in animal models like multiple sclerosis, certain cancer models, um, diabetic models. Uh, brain dysfunction, cognitive impairment models, and some human models of disease and inflammation is this five-day fasting mimicking diet. And remarkably, and I'm telling you some stuff that hasn't been published at all, but I have an inside access to some of the research being done in University of Southern California and other parts of the world, is um, uh, when they designed, when Dr. Walter Longo designed a five-day program of 800 calories a day, uh, that was very low in protein, very low in simple carb. The idea was that that would activate ketosis, that would activate autophagy. We'd see measurable benefit. What he may be underestimated, if I say that correctly, is uh, the fact that it's a plant-based whole food five-day program, because you are eating 800 calories a day, is causing changes in the microbiome much faster and more impressive than we thought. And these are creating you know, production of very healthy um, changes in the gut, and we all know that gut health is the basis of a lot of health. So for so many people, one, who've never gone five days in a row at 800 calories a day, two, who've never done five days in a row plant-based foods, whole foods, 
this has proven to be a radically helpful introduction to the idea, while it actually benefits you directly by some weight loss and inflammation control, blood pressure control, changes in your microbiome, and uh, it's all one happy kind of tool that we have out of the plant-based world. Yeah, it seems like the ultimate tune-up, so to speak, uh, taking the car yeah, to the shop and it just It is overhaul. very much just what you said. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, some people will experience it with clarity of thought. Uh, some will have less pain in a knee or a hip or a shoulder. I'm one of those people and don't have any of those pains anymore. Some will see significant weight loss sustained. And others, it's sort of faith-based. You know, mm -hmm. I'm doing something for five days that the science is extremely strong. May help promote a more youthful body and a more youthful metabolism. It's pretty yeah. awesome. You know, tool to have so my questions around that are um specifically related to what you were talking about before you know the real benefits of fasting coming after a few days when we deplete glycogen stores and how can we experience the benefits of fasting while still having while still having glycogen or while we're still yeah. feeding yeah yeah so it's it's really unique that yeah. this program exists and I don't want to beat around the bush. Um, there is a, a box you can buy, you and yeah. I and everybody called Prolon. It's 800 calories a day, it's pre-made food, it's not chemical laden, it's non-GMO and it's all there and it was constructed very, very carefully at the University of Southern California to provide just the right nutrient mix as safe as possible. There's a very long list on the website of who shouldn't do it, you know, type 1 diabetics, pregnant mothers, underweight individuals, people on, uh, you know, a variety of diabetic meds where they might get hypoglycemic. But for the general public, I mean, the fact that you could eat 800 calories a day, enough just to keep you out of, you know, being hangry all the time, enough that you can go to work and function. Here in uh, southeastern Michigan, we just ran a program, First in the World, where 120 factory workers did five days in a row of this fasting mimicking diet called Prolon. And it was really unique while they were working, while they were functioning, we got you know a large group of people to do it and they're gonna do it again and they're gonna do it again because it's often recommended to do three months in a row, five days with it. And you know it'll be interesting to see uh, how much that changes their selections because a lot of people will come to the realization they were eating too much, they weren't eating enough whole foods. Again, what's missing from Prolon is it's not big salads and apples and grapes because it is a box of uh, packaged food so that you can take it home and use it, you know, uh, at work or at home. But it'd be really radical to see. So, the, you know, it's uh, yeah, the, the, the food's in the stomach, but the body doesn't sense it because aging pathways are largely triggered by sugar and protein, uh, particularly. So, um, yeah, it, it, yeah. Can you do it on your own? I don't know. I've never tried to do this on my own. Um, I respect how many years it took Dr. Longo to create this mm -hmm. absolutely balanced and uh, scientifically proven program. So, I uh, I don't innovate. I just duplicate. So, yeah. Well, that's that's always smart. I don't have to recreate anything. <laughs> But um, so in the in the in the FMD in the Prolon five day fasting mimicking diet, are ketone levels increasing? I mean, are and and how? I guess that's what my question is. How do we get into ketosis while eating? Because my understanding yeah. is you're either you're in ketosis when you're like either fasting entirely or just eating fat, essentially. So they don't, they don't require it, but you can go to your local vitamin shop or drugstore and buy ketone test strips. If you want to be on that, you can get uh, more advanced blood monitors and there are people that actually monitor their level of ketone bodies. I did the urine test strip just out of interest. Um, and if you eat a reduced calorie diet with no added refined carbs, your blood glucose level actually will go down and your body, I'm not sure exactly the exact mechanism by which your liver senses that your blood glucose is down, but you will start to activate uh, the, the use of fat as an alternative fuel, and that's creation of ketone bodies, or particularly beta-hydroxybutyrate. So um, it doesn't happen after one day. If you did two days of this and stopped, 
you would not create it, but on the third, fourth, fifth day you do. And that's really is the magic. You can do the same thing by doing a four or five day water fast. You will clearly create the same effect, but you probably won't be as likely to be able to function as well. Yeah. Uh, and probably won't be able to reach as many people. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you know, something that always comes to mind when uh, specifically around the, in the context of weight release and weight loss and longevity is stress. And I could see how a low calorie diet could be very stressful. What's your experience yeah. with that? And how do you maybe counsel yourself or other people when on a calorie restricted diet? Yeah, and the only situation, I mean, the only thing I advise my patients is 12 to 14 hours a day without eating, 10, 11, 12 hours a day of eating. Yeah. And most can handle that quite well, you know, four, five, six days a week and mess up a little bit on the weekend. And, um, you know, the second is to do this five day program. Um, and, and I also am pretty clear about telling them which patients shouldn't do it. You know, type 1 diabetics, you don't want to risk hypoglycemia in somebody on three diabetic medicines. Of course, you know, diabetes is the spectrum from pre diabetes, easy, they can do it. So maybe they're a type 2 diabetic with a big belly and they're maybe on one low dose medicine, they probably can do it. But if you're on three diabetic drugs or you're injecting insulin or you're known to be a type 1 diabetic, I mean, you're not going to respond to the potential for. Uh, lower blood sugar very well, and I would not advise it. Um, you know, there, there's something called type 1.5 diabetes or late late adult diabetes, a lot of. So you have to be a little careful, uh, and I do say no to some people not to do it. Um, I guess um, I guess I was more. Oh, in terms of stress, yeah, you know, mental, you know, it's challenging. There's yeah. a, there is a just, you know, you need goal oriented people. You need to sell the sizzle that this is the most yeah. scientific supported patented u.s patent office about six weeks ago gave the first patent ever for extending healthy lifespan to this five-day food plant program which is pretty radical but so this is the only one out there i sell the sizzle i mean this has the potential to you know really at your core make you a younger more healthy person it's like going off to a spa but you don't have to spend thousands of dollars to rent a room and fly. You can do this right while you're working. Um, and people are pretty motivated to do it right. A lot of them have read the Longevity Diet book by Dr. Longo or have seen a uh, interview with him. Um, you know, there's a little bit of hangry with it, no doubt. Um, stress, um, not, not per se. I mean, there's, there, you know, there is a statement, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that is kind of the backbone of autophagy. Or there's another medical term, hormesis, which is basically it's by applying a little stress. Exercise slightly damages the body, but you end up advantaged and um, gain more than you lost at the end of a day of exercise. And that's what you're getting here. You're, here you are stressing your physiology a bit. You're changing your physiology. You're activating these innate, unused pathways that can restore and repair the body. Uh, then most of us never activate because we're eating three, four, five times a day. And these are pathways that are activated by calorie depletion. But um, uh, but you're much better at the end of the process for it and much, you know, much more likely to have repaired. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank you for that response. I really, it's, it's the answer that I was looking for, I think, because I think in general, people really need to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, stretching the yeah. range of where, you know, both physiologically as well as mentally, emotionally, and just kind of like getting out of the comfort bubble. Well, yeah, that moderation and everything is not, you know, it doesn't apply to quality of food choices, doesn't apply to quantity of food choices, doesn't apply to the spectrum of food choices for most of us. You know, I like Dr. Furman's uh, comment about, you know, nutritional excellence or there's another guy out there who uses the term be a qualitarian. Be really focused on, you know, the fuel you put in your body should be as high quality as pulling up to a gas station with a brand new sports car. You're not going to look for the bargain discount. You're going to put what you got to put. You're going to ruin the engine and we're much more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers to that. Um, on that note, 
could you tell us a little bit about your personal relationship with food and lifestyle nowadays? I mean, like we kind of, like I started this conversation, I think before we started recording, if you're flying all over the place, you're talking on here and there and Dr. Oz yeah. and Joe Rogan and like, how are yeah. you nourishing yourself throughout all of these day to day? Well, it's a good question, but it's it's a very much born of habits at this point. I adopted a plant-based diet at age 18 and 42 years ago it was, thank you, University of Michigan dormitory. The food was so awful that actually it was not a health crisis. It was a salad bar opportunity. And as I got into medical school, I learned that there was something about this. And then John Robbins had a big impact on me. Ultimately, Dean Ornish had a big impact on me very early in my career. So... I've learned, and you know, the thing I've added by understanding more about calorie restriction and, and uh, time restricted feeding and such is, yeah, you know, if I miss a meal, I miss a meal. Frankly, it happens pretty unusual that I'm in, you know, a situation in an airport or running around that I don't have something that's pleasing on an airplane. I'd generally rather not eat than eat on an airplane, even if you're offered a free meal up front. But you know, so I'm very comfortable with the idea that I may only get two meals today. That's actually my norm frequently take two meals a day. That's new in the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, the food part works out fine. I've been at restaurants all over the place and I'll just go to the side dishes and get some spinach and get a big potato and get some asparagus and I'm happy as can be while everybody's eating, you know, 24 ounce steaks. In fact, just an anecdote, probably about eight weeks ago, I was in Miami at a world symposium on stem cell and longevity which I somehow snuck myself onto the program as the moderator because I'm not primarily a stem cell guy, although this food program does release stem cells in your blood. I'm a, I'm a natural stem cell release guy, not an injecting mm -hmm. stem cell release guy. It's amazing. They get stem cells, and I'm not pointing out to anybody in particular, but they're eating these gigantic, you know, I don't know if they're grass-fed or CAFO lot. I have no idea. It's gigantic, and, you know, nobody's eating the asparagus, and, we still are dealing with, I mean, I would not do that. I mean, I would like to slap these people and say, my God, your entire career is on anti-aging and stem cells and longevity and you're researchers and you've started up companies and you got PhDs, but I mean, what about your plate? I mean, you know, this, this process has to start on the plate. And uh, uh, so I'm very careful about my food, but I don't really find it very stressful. I, a couple snacks in the office, I'll just show you, I don't have any interest. There's a wonderful doc. That taught me about lupini beans. This is a shameless plug for a company I have no interest in. Rami lupini beans, and man, these little bags, uh, they're low carb, low cal beans, uh, organic, I love them. So have stuff like that around them. I, you know, I don't fear anymore that I'm gonna wither away in six hours if I left my home back lunch at home. I, I work out 20, 25 minutes a day in the morning. Might be a run, might be a, a rowing machine, might be some weights, might be some yoga. Uh, I'm pretty consistent with it, but I'm not looking for much more than that. I do believe moderation and exercise has uh, won the day as opposed to extremeness and exercise, but you got to do something. I sleep pretty well. I usually wear a sleep tracker. Uh, um, I play with it, a little GABA, a little melatonin, a little, little valerian, a little meditation, blue light blocking glasses. I'm willing to biohack a little. And, uh, and so saying that's pretty much a priority. I do beat it up sometimes with red eyes by four. You know, mindfulness, gratitude. I supplement. I am not a, I am not a plant only person. Uh, nobody knows, is there a supplement that's going to extend life? There are supplements that appear to have the ability. They're called CR mimetics, calorie restriction mimetics. Is there a vitamin that can activate the same pathways that eating 30% less calories every day activates? This wouldn't be a substitute for the five-day fasting mimicking diet, but it, it, is, it is attractive to the idea that all those other days, other stuff. So resveratrol falls in that group. Do we know that anybody's going to live one day longer taking resveratrol or polyphenol from grapes and peanuts? We don't know that. And I don't actually even recommend it to my patients. But I read on this stuff. Uh, there's uh, metformin as a prescription drug for diabetes. I don't take that, but there is interest. So, I mean, supplements are attractive. There are some anti-aging longevity experts in the world that take over 100 a day. I guarantee you they don't eat so perfect, but they believe that. I think that's crazy, but 
in my clinic, there are some supplements that have shown promise in reversing plaque. In addition to whole food plant diet, um, there are some, you know, I, I monitor a lot of advanced chemistry in my patients, you know, omega-3 levels. So um, I do supplement most days. Uh, I think, you know, uh, it, that's where vitamins, it, it, that's where there is some role for moderation. I don't believe superior life requires that you say, all vitamins are bad. I certainly don't think taking 100 a day makes much sense. I mean, and I got a great family. I got a lot of passion and purpose. And um, Moya, you know, the Blue Zones have a Japanese word, Moya, for running with a group. I've got a real nice group of like-minded MDs. I will tell you, this is a little shameless plug. I'm talking to you from suburban Detroit. About four and a half years ago, a guy called me and said, my name is Paul Chatlin. I was supposed to have bypass surgery nine months ago at age 54, 55. I found out about Esselstyn as I was about to be wheeled into the operating room to have my bypass. I checked out of the hospital. I checked in with Dr. Esselstyn. He was calling me nine months later. He had lost tons of weight. His cholesterol was down. His heart symptoms went away. He was doing amazing. But he said to me, I'm kind of lonely. The wife, the coworkers, the friends think I'm crazy being so careful with my diet. Yes. Follows a doctor assistant, Dr. Ornish, Dr. Permanar. Do we make a support group? And I said, Paul, we'll make a support group for 20 people, uh, January 2014. Well, here we are at uh, this time point. We have almost 6,000 members in Detroit. Um, nobody could have ascertained that the Plant Based Nutrition Support Group or PBNSG.org on the web would ever have grown to the largest nutrition support group in the world right here in Detroit. So. I'm never lonely. I mean, we have meetings with 100 people or 500 people or 400 people or 900 people in small groups and cooking classes and demos. And frankly, it's all grassroots. The hospitals don't want anything to do with it because we're talking about disease reversal. Um, we have very little funding. But um, so, you know, life's very full of like-minded people, which is always a nice thing. Anybody in any city, find a doctor, nurse, PA that's passionate and one crazy patient, you might end up with a support group with a thousand people. Chicago right now is going through this process of developing a very efficient um, plant support group for patients, uh, which I'm excited about. That's awesome. Yeah, I uh, personally feel like feel like I'm always kind of looking for my people, and I know that they exist and they're here and there, and it's just a matter of bringing them together and now we've got obviously the internet social media kind of branching the trees of this uh the branches of this tree are coming together so it's it's beautiful and important lastly i know you've got to wrap things up and shoot off to the next patient but um if you could in speaking of supplements not necessarily a supplement but if you could encapsulate something whether it's a food or a practice or a supplement and just serve it to everybody or drop it in the water supply, what would that be, Dr. Khan? Mm, I don't know. Food would be broccoli sprouts. <laughs> um, you know, there's a whole pathway some of your listeners know too, but you know, that broccoli is like a glow stick. Broccoli has two chemicals within its cells, and until you chop them up or chew them up, the two don't get in contact with each other like a glow stick that's suddenly glowing. When you do that with broccoli, you get something called sulforaphane, so incredible antioxidant promoting, anti-aging promoting, natural chemical that we get from chewing on broccoli if you don't microwave it to death before you start chewing it. Um, and you can get 50 times more with broccoli sprouts. And there's a lot of promise for cholesterol control, blood pressure control, uh, blood sugar control. There's pathways involved with cancer generation. So eat your broccoli sprouts would be one. And if I had to say in the supplement world, it would probably be omega-3. I do blood work. In fact, I, uh, I'll cover up the name. But my nurses just hand me. I'm always filling out sheets with fairly advanced blood work. I send uh, to something called the Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland Heart Lab. But I measure omega-3 levels. In, thousands of patients and whether they're omnivore meat eaters which i have plenty of patients that are whether they're hardcore followers of dr Furman, dr bernard dr esselstyn and such it's challenging unless you're eating a lot of fish every day like you know fatty fish like sardine herring or salmon 
to get enough omega-3. And my patients that eat a lot of fish, their mercury levels high. So choose what you want. You want a lot of omega-3, you get a lot of mercury with it, which is very bad for your health. Or you're not eating a lot of fatty fish. It's challenging, even with the chia, even with the flax, even with the hemp, even with the uh, walnuts and the leafy greens. So I am a fan. Again, I have no interest in boosting you know, a little bit with algae omega-3. This just, I have it on the windowsill. Is a common brand. It's not the only one. They, you know, they clearly are mercury-free. They also may be better than commercial fish oils because uh, fish is uh, fish is called a bioaccumulator. A lot of nasty stuff ends up in fish flesh. In 2018, 2019, it wasn't the case 100 years ago when water purity was better. But PCBs and DDTs, and, uh, yeah. various uh, chemicals, uh, heavy metals like mercury, for sure. So anyways, if you said, is there one uh, a nutrient I could jack up high, it would be omega-3. Uh, and do it with, and do it every way you can. Eat your walnuts, eat your leafy greens. If you're using an oil, don't yell at me, buy organic canola oil. It's the highest oil out there. Uh, but you have to buy organic because it's not safe there. Um, you know, but uh, do your chia, do your hemp, do your flax. Uh, but maybe consider adding in one of those little puppies and algae-based omega-3 every day. I have a few patients that are trying so hard to be wonderful, whole food, plant-based, really healthy eaters, and their arthritis is flat. When I do their blood work, their omega-3 levels are very low, and these people tend to respond real well to drenching their inflammation with a lot of omega-3. All right. Great pearls, Dr. Khan, and, and thanks again for your time. It's been a pleasure, and uh, thanks, listeners out there. And until next time, peace and love. You bet. It was a pleasure. You All bet. Right.